If you have your copy of God's Word with you, if you would join me in John 19. John 19, if you'd find verse 17, we'll begin there in, in just a moment. Uh, this is a, a wonderful text of Scripture, and I know you've probably heard several messages from me through, through John, taking a kind of sidestep from uh, going through the book of Philippians. And uh, so this is in the middle of a story that is taking place in Jesus's uh, his arrest uh, from the Garden of Gethsemane. He was betrayed. He was uh, delivered uh, up over to Pontius Pilate, and uh, Pilate is uh, having discussion with Jesus, finding out who he is and why the Jewish leaders are wanting to uh, get rid of Jesus. All these things have taken place, and we're going to pick up here in verse 17, and a lot of details here that I want to cover and, and, and go through, and this is a, a kind of a big body of, of text here, but I'll, let me just say a few things about the story. Uh, first off, this is something that's usually dealt with around Easter, <laughs> and I get it that it's not Easter today. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why texts like this can be avoided uh, is maybe we've heard it so much before. Well, I've already heard about Jesus. He was tried. He went to the cross, and so going to a text like this is... Uh, Man, we, we've heard all that. You've heard it your whole life. But I don't know about you. I don't ever want to get to the point where I'm just tired of hearing about Jesus going to a cross for my sake and for my salvation. And so uh, as a disciples, we just always learn, and there's always more to take in. I would also say this not only is this a wonderful text of Scripture, this is a dangerous text of Scripture. The reason why this is a dangerous text of Scripture is because eternity is on the line based on what you do with what you hear today. When someone is confronted with the cross of Jesus Christ and the story about Jesus going to a cross, it kind of leaves you in one of two places. You can hear it and think, yeah, I have heard that before. Awesome. And just kind of carry on about your day. Or you could take this story in and it does something to you you realize that he's up there for you, and this becomes very personal to you. And, uh, and it, it's meant to produce saving belief in Jesus Christ. There are two reasons why that John is, is, is going into so much detail about Jesus going to a cross. Uh, let me just give you kind of two purpose statements. So the, the text that we're in begins in verse 17, but if you just kind of want to go down all the way down to verse thir uh, 34, excuse me, verse 35, notice he stops the story to tell you something right here in verse 35. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, here's why, so that you may believe. So John is taking time to give you all these details. And by the way, he says, look, it's true. In fact, I'm not just a, any kind of person just giving time. I've seen everything I'm writing to you in person, an eyewitness testimony so that you may believe. There is a whole purpose of why the gospel of John as a whole is even written. If you just turn the page again to the next chapter, chapter 20, go down to verse 30, John says this, there's other things that happen that I didn't write about. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I didn't tell you everything. But these, the ones I've written, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John has taken time to tell you the intended purpose. This is why he has written these things, is so that you may believe. It's a wonderful text of Scripture. It's a dangerous text of Scripture because you could come across this and it do nothing to you. But the title of the message today is that you may believe, that you may believe. That's, that would be the intended result that, uh, for all of us uh, today, I hope. Back up to verse 17 of John chapter 19. I'm just going to pick up this story, and I'm just going to put on my teaching hat today and just kind of show you some nuggets through the, the details and kind of just pull some, st some things out for us today. If you look at John 19 verse 17, Pilate has just handed him back over to the Jewish uh, leaders, uh, which in turn uh, Romans take over. But in verse 17 it says, And he bearing his cross 
went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. So John, by way of telling the story, he gives you a summary statement up front. He tells you kind of this whole story in a nutshell. He's going to flush out details and look back on this and, and give you some information. But right here, here's the summary statement. Here is uh, what happened, that he, bearing his cross, went to a place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Golgotha it, it means skull in Hebrew and has Aramaic origin. The Latin word for skull is Calvaria, where we get the English word Calvary. And so this place that Jesus would go on a hill called Calvary is this place of a skull. And uh, in fact, the, there is a, a place there that you can go and visit in Israel today, and it appears just like a skull. The appearance of the rock, it looks like the face of a skull. So it's, even its appearance is kind of where it's getting its name. And then it says this is that place where they crucified him. There were two others with him, so there are two other people there. John's not going to focus on them. He's going to focus all the details on the one that's in the middle. You won't hear from these other two until later in the story uh, when they break their legs. And he's just putting them here so that it makes sense later when he tells you that. But he's going to focus on one in the middle. Let me just kind of highlight for us right here the influence on his cross. This is kind of all the details are going to surround the influence while Jesus is on his cross. You know you're influential, you know you carry a lot of influence that even on a cross you got influence, right? Some people, the way you get influence is you climb a ladder, you get very successive in life, you follow your dreams and you get there and then that's the place you can have influence. It doesn't matter what you do with Jesus, wherever you take him and him by carrying his own cross, he's got influence. And then you put him on the cross and he's got influence. And so I'm going to flush this out, the influence that he has on his cross, let me deal with the influence for us. It was Roman practice for someone to carry their own cross uh, to the place they would be crucified. And when they would take this cross, it, they wouldn't take the whole thing. They would take just the cross member. Let me just give you first off a picture of a Roman cross. We'll have a picture for you up on the screen. This is a first century replica of a Roman cross. That was taken... Uh, by my cell phone camera, there's a glass screen in front of it, in Nazareth. When you go to Nazareth, there's a place called Nazareth Village, and they, they, it's a first century replica. You could see what a vineyard would have looked like, a watchtower would have looked like, all these things. It was awesome. Uh, a threshing floor, all that kind of stuff, and it kind of helps read the Bible in color. So if you've seen a cross maybe on a Hollywood movie. It doesn't quite look like that, right? The cross in Hollywood that, man, it's super tall. Man, they're looking up at him like this, and you know, and man, he's way up there, and uh, the, I just, the, the way they were explaining this here is the, the Romans would not have wasted that much wood on you. Uh, so the least amount of wood uh, possible, that, that would be uh, the, the best, right? So these are criminals in their mind. And so this cross is about just the size of just uh, someone uh, that, that, that is just normal height. And so when you were, well, they would place someone on the cross, and then when we, and if you have this in mind, and you read texts like they were mocking him, they weren't mocking him up like this, or when they were spitting at him, like trying to spit and hope that they would reach Jesus, it was more like this, eye level. And so that kind of puts it in, I mean, it was anybody, you know, they, walking up, wagging their heads is kind of what it says, making eye contact with Jesus. But as they would carry their cross, they would just carry that cross member. The other place would be there waiting for them. In this case, the place of a skull is where this is waiting, and they would carry that cross member. And it says, and he, Jesus, was bearing his cross. However, let me just point this out. Jesus is not just following Roman orders here because he has to. Jesus is doing all of this because he chose to do this. It's not just simply that it's, oh, Roman practice and all these authorities get on him and, and, and they, they bound him up and they're forcing him to do this. In fact, you wouldn't have even had to do any of that. He was going there willingly. He chose to do this. If you would back up just a moment, I'm going to show you something in, in, in Scripture. If you go back to John 18, just a chapter before in the Garden of Gethsemane scene. If you look at verse 4, 
This is when G, uh, Judas is bringing with him, uh, uh, it tells you in verse 3, uh, he's received a detachment of troops, uh, officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. They came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. What are they thinking that they're going to do? They're thinking there's a resistance coming. They're prepared to fight. In fact, the detachment there is 600 sh- soldiers. They're coming expecting that this is, there is going to be a fight happen. Verse 4, Jesus, therefore, Notice this, this is going to show up in our text in John 19, knowing what he knows, knowing all things that would come upon him, look at this, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? I just kind of want to focus on that two-word phrase there, went forward. What would his disciples do? When they come for Jesus, what do they end up do? They go backward. What does Jesus do? Steps up into it embraces it. In fact, it's kind of ironic. They bond him. In verse 12, it says the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers, the Jews, arrested Jesus and bound him. That's kind of funny. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the Superman movie, but then Superman, they, they put like handcuffs on him. He's like, this is crazy. We think this is, I mean, this is, this is the God of the universe, right? You're going to bond him. You don't have to do any of that. They did that, but Jesus is going willingly. It's, that's what's ironic, but he goes forward. He went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? Jesus is carrying his own cross because he chose to. That should influence us because the same is applied for believers. Jesus carrying his own cross is what influences disciples today. And this idea of the cross, what it represents, death. Discipleship in and of itself, that word is, yes, it means to follow after another, right? To sit underneath them. But Jesus brings in the theme of a cross. So to to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what's that going to mean for you? Death. That's that picture, the, 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 the cross. Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and then follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and then follow after me. Cross, this idea of death, is the theme of discipleship. Jesus is the example of discipleship only because he went first. Jesus bared his own cross, and then you as a disciple, it won't take you long before you're confronted with yours. You may not realize it, but there's a cross out there. If you want to follow Jesus, that has your name on it. And Jesus has it for you, and because Jesus took up his cross... If you're going to follow after him, you have one that you're going to have to take up and then follow after him, and it's going to carry you to a place that he chooses. But this is all meant, this whole reason why this is told is that you may believe. This detail that you may believe. If you go back into John 19, we're going to go with the, de- the, 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 the details. This is the influence. There was an influence, a great influence, I believe, on us as disciples. But there are people that are influenced in the text. In fact, there's many people who are influenced in the text. If you look back in verse 19 of John 19, now Pilate wrote a title, and an inscription, and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This is unique to John, the, 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 the part where it says Jesus of Nazareth. The other gospels don't mention that, but John puts this in there. It's connecting us. Remember when Jesus said, whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus would say, I am he, and then they all fall down. They all just just get knocked over just by him invoking that name, I am. And so uh, this uh, Jesus of Nazareth, that part's not confrontational. The confrontational part is the next phrase, the king of the Jews. That's the part they were like, we don't, we don't want that, but that's the, the influence that he's carrying, the king of the Jews. But notice how this focal point happens and this influence that's carried. Look in verse 20. Then many of the Jews read this title. Two reasons why. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Second reason. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So, Jesus, this place of a skull, it's near the city. And so everyone around could see it because it's close by. And so what are they seeing? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Not only that, but it's written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And so uh, Hebrew, the Jews could read it. Latin, if you were a Roman, if you were a soldier, an army, you could read Latin. And if you could read Greek, that meant every nation of the world that's there would understand that language. Everybody would not miss this title, Jesus, King of the Jews. I think it's kind of funny that they get mad at the influence Jesus has even while he is on the cross. 
And so Acts 2, 5 would tell us that there was many, there was devout Jews dwelling in Jerusalem from, under, from every nation under heaven. So all kinds of people there from every nation, and they can all read this title, Jesus, King of the Jews. Notice how the chief priests are influenced. Look with me in verse 21. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Just add that one phrase, he's not our king. Twitter was around back then, it had been hashtag not my king. Right, this, this, we don't want anything to do with this man. In fact, here's what they want to do with it. Go back up into the text and look at verse 15. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. That's our king. We're, we'll, confirm our, we'll confirm our loyalty to Rome. That's our king. That man is not our king. Just simply write, he said, I am king of the Jews. And so this place, this title that would be written above a criminal would be to deter you from committing that crime. It was meant to say, here is why this person is being crucified. And when you go by and read it, it would say, I don't need to do that because I don't want to end up like this man. And so uh, as they're looking by the Jews near the city, and everybody can read this, they're looking this, this is the king of the Jews? And it absolutely, absolutely is. Jesus has influence no matter where he is. You can't stamp that out. And they are so frustrated that even on his cross, he is getting more influence than they would prefer, even while nailed to a cross. I'll just tell you, you can reject Jesus all you want, but you can't stop his influence. You can reject him, you can read us, you can hear a sermon like this, but I'm just telling you, you can't get away from the influence of Jesus Christ, even in your own life. The fact that you're even hearing this sermon today, that you're brought, Jesus is carrying in some kind of influence in your life. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but I was watching like the CMT Awards, the country music thing. It was happening on me on TV, and they were kind of honoring Reba McIntyre. And there was a man during that that just got up and and just prayed on national television, and just stopped and just said, "Man, I just got to pray." And I just think that you know what? That's a great example that you just no matter where you go. There's going to be a believer somewhere. <laughs> and you can't stamp out the influence that Jesus Christ, no matter where you go, and the more and more you try to get rid of him, the more and more it just seems to grow. This influence is absolutely everywhere. Just another example, the people that, you know, the word Christmas, and Christians get all upset about this, right? That Christmas, the way it's written, they would take out the word Christ, right? And they would put the X and put Xmas, and right, Christians get all upset, you know, because well, they've Xed out Christ, and they're just writing Xmas, uh, you know, they just put X and then must. And but here's the thing: you, you, that even is showing influence of Christ because the Greek letter Chi, the, the capital letter, is an X. <laughs> and so, in trying to X out Christ, that's actually a Christian symbol all throughout. Christian history, you look, the Kai is the Christian symbol. I'm just telling you, you can't get rid of the influence. You try to exit out, it's still there. You try to go somewhere else, it's still there. You can't. And by the way, you don't have to get riled up with somebody about that. Who can't, you can't stamp out his influence. It is absolutely everywhere. And I'll just tell you, the greatest influence you and I will ever have is the moment we pick up our cross. You want influence in this life? World tells you, get a successful job, you know, uh, make money, do all these other things, and then you're going to have some influence. I'll just tell you, you can have influence right now if you'll pick up that cross that's got your name on it. If you would take that cross and you carry that wherever Christ is calling you to do that, you carry your own cross, I'm just telling you, you're going to have an incredible influence, an incredible influence on your family, your, who's your one, that one that you got, you carry your cross. And I'm just telling you, uh, that the influence can just go far and wide, farther than you ever ex would expect. But they carry your cross. It's the greatest way to have influence. Let me give you another group that's influenced here in the text. And this would be the soldiers. If you look in verse 22, Pilate responds to their request or their command, really. What I've written, I've written. In other words, I'm not changing it. 
Well, then the story shifts, says, now then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top in one piece. Uh, Therefore they said themselves among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they, cla- they cast lots. And that's a quotation of Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. So here's the influence of the soldiers. They are doing things that they was just normal to do. Spoils of war, that's what you get, right? And so this is whatever criminal had. This is, this is now ours. So get his sandals off. Get these other pieces of garments off. We'll divide them all up. And these are all ours. And then it says this tunic, by the way, they can't tear it. It's woven in one piece, and so instead of tearing it and kind of ruining the thing, they think, well, let's just cast lots for it. And so they make this decision among themselves and do that, and John says, oh, yeah, by the way, all that was done to fulfill Scripture. So it, it, it doesn't matter even what you do. You think you're doing one thing, and yet God is accomplishing a completely other. Unbeknownst to them, this is just what they're doing. And yet John says... It's doing it all to fulfill Scripture. In fact, if you look right after that quotation of Psalm, look what it says. Therefore, the soldier did these things. In other words, don't miss this. This is why they are doing it. They are fulfilling Scripture that was written roughly a thousand years before they were even born. I'm just telling you, this is another great reason why you can trust in God's Word. This is why just anywhere, you, God will not stop fulfilling every single detail that he's promised. And I believe that's not only true in Scripture, but that's true in our own lives. And so, therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now a group now is going to shift again. Here's the bystanders. Here's, here's the, the influence he has on them. Look at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. By the way, to understand that, that's four different women there. Not, you can read it as two, three, or four, but the way that's written, that's four different women there. And then in verse 26, it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother, he's got something to say to her and then a disciple as well. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Let me just pull something out of this. Not only is Jesus suffering as the Lamb of God on the cross, he is suffering, providing for the sins of everyone that's there, those standing by for the sins of his own mom, the sins of the disciple, the sins of everybody. He's suffering there as the Lamb of God providing for their sins, and yet he's still thinking of them in this very moment providing for his own mother right now, providing for her by saying, John, you take care of her now. John, you take her back to your own home. And providing just the thought of still thinking of somebody else while he's on the cross. He does that, by the way, in another gospel with, the, with one of the two that's standing beside him, that's crucified with him. Right, One of them starts uh, uh, jumping in with the accusations and, and, you know, can't you save yourself kind of stuff. And, and uh, the other one on the other side rebukes him. And says, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Even while on his cross, still thinking of somebody else. I just say, hallelujah, what a savior we truly have. That even in that moment, still thinking and providing for those who are around them. The influence on his cross, you can't get around. It's incredible. But there's just amount as much influence of his death. The story is now going to shift now to his death. In fact, there's two transitional statements. If you look back in your text, look in verse 28. Again, still got my teaching hat on, so I just want to pull this out for you. Verse 28, after this, if you go down to verse 38, it says the same thing. After this. And so this is the way John breaks up this story. So there's a first kind of section that we just dealt with, the influence uh, that Jesus has on his cross. This next section now in verse 28 is going to shift it. He's still focusing on the cross that's in the center, but now he shifts it towards his death. So this whole next section is going to deal with his death. Verse 38 is going to have another shift and deal with something else. Look with me in verse 28 when it says, After this, Jesus, 
knowing that all things were now accomplished. We heard that now, right? You remember that? I didn't put you to sleep. Hopefully you remember that from the Garden of Gethsemane. There was something he knew that was coming. Knowing that all things were now accomplished. See, back then it says he knew all things that were getting ready to happen, and he stepped forward. Now he knows it's already been done. There's nothing left. That the scripture might be fulfilled said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Verses 28 and verse through verse 30 makes up uh, what theologians would call an inclusio, which means it is a bracket. The word to tellsty is the same word for accomplished in your Bible in verse 28. And this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, to tell Stai, it's been done. And then what he knows, he actually speaks out in verse 30, when he received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And so you see a bracket there. It, he knows this has now all been done. Now he says it's all been done. And so it makes up this one section. It's a literary device to use emphasis to, to show uh, this is very, very important, and it uses uh, emphasis in that way. But in verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he has fulfilled the Father's will perfectly, completely obeyed the Father's will, and didn't leave one thing out. That's very good, because if he leaves one thing out, guess what? We have no hope for our salvation. This is what it took for him to obey the Father's will all the way to the very end. Satan would come in, and he's going to try to trip him up, just get him to fall just once. But if he does that or misses anything, he is no longer the spotless Lamb of God. Aren't you glad that our Savior, what a Savior we have, would fulfill God's will completely all the way up and to the very end? And he knew it. Notice the way Scripture is fulfilled. Remember, John's going to be big on this right here. Someone will do something, and yet unbeknownst to them, they end up fulfilling Scripture. It was written roughly around 1,000 years before they even existed. Look at, look at the way this is written. I, this is, to me, it's just amazing. He says, I thirst. But here's what the fulfillment is. It's not the words, I thirst. Some would say that's the fulfillment of Scripture. My view is it's verse 29 is the fulfillment of Scripture. Look at verse 29. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. Here's the way I think you should read that. Now a vessel full of sour wine just happened to be sitting there. You see it? You see the difference now? It's, this is the fulfillment. Oh, by the way, there was just this vessel of wine that, that, that is going to fulfill Scripture that was written a thousand years before it was ever even written about. Now, what's this going to do, this vessel full of sour wine? They filled a sponge, and the they is the soldiers. We can get that from the flow of the text, but uh, in Luke, we see it's the soldiers as well. They put it to his mouth, or they, they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. There's the fulfillment. Listen to Psalm uh, sixty-nine twenty-one. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so there it is in the Psalms, written that long ago. And oh, by the way, this fulfillment, this vessel full of sour wine, just coincidentally happened to just be sitting there. You think, man, why, why so important on the details? Why, why God just would do all this? Let me just give you this. Whatever God says, I'm just telling you, you can base your, you can base your life on it. Because he will fulfill every single thing he said before. So if he's fulfilled all this stuff about his first coming, this is, we're dealing with his first coming. Uh, he, he comes to, uh, to the earth, God sent him, and he's fulfilled all that. Then guess what? He will fulfill everything, every single detail about his second coming when he returns. And I'll just tell you this, he is returning. And he returns as the victorious king of kings and lord of lords. And whatever you do with this story, hopefully that you may believe that'll be a very good day for you. But when he comes again and you say, well, I've heard this, but I, it just didn't do nothing to me. I'm just, that is not going to be a good day. That is not going to be, and I'm just telling you, he will fulfill every single detail. And it's, to me, just the word of God is incredible. You look at this stuff, and it's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. And to me, it just gives me confidence to trust him even more with my own life.
but it's why we can base our own eternity off of God's word. God is able to fulfill every detail. And so what Jesus knows, he in fact speaks. Notice what he actually says, this word to tell sty. If you look back in verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. What he's saying is it's done. It's completed. Nothing else needs to be done in regards to the work of our salvation. He came, he fulfilled everything perfectly for us, meaning you and I can't do anything. There's nothing else. He's already done it. What can we do to, for our salvation? Can I go do a bunch of good stuff? Can I, you just name it and whatever we try to do and you just talk to people and people have this idea in mind that they're going to get into heaven based on the good that they've done. They're going to get into heaven based on some kind of thing that they've done or get into heaven based on something that they've not done or they're not going to go to heaven based on something they've not done. This whole idea with your eternity is based on what Jesus has done. You can't do anything, but you can believe. This is the whole you can believe on Jesus Christ when you hear something like this. And this is the whole thing behind the who's your one. What, what can, we can't do anything to save somebody, but we can put something out there in front of them. We can give them the story, the good news of the gospel. And they don't have to do anything but believe because the work has already be done, been done. You don't have to add anything to it. Jesus finished the work on the cross. And the moment you believe on him, guess what? All of that finished work on the cross is then applied to your life. And then you inherit his righteousness. And then he is, at this point, taking on your sin. So here's the thing. You can either believe on Jesus Christ and find your righteousness by faith in him, or one day, you can, as a result of rejecting this, you pay for your sins. And then you do it. So you can have Jesus do it, or you can do it, and the, it all hinges on what you do when you hear a sermon just like this. It's a wonderful text, but it's also just as dangerous as well. The purpose that you may believe. Something John doesn't want you to miss here. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This could have been written a different way. But it's written in the active voice of the subject. So bowing his head, Jesus, Jesus gave up his spirit. In other words, they didn't kill him. He, he laid down his life. And just notice the flow of it. Bowing his head. It's not that he died, then he bowed his head. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It fulfills what it said in John 10, that I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it back up again. Jesus gave up his spirit. He is the one that laid it down. And I would just say, don't miss this. He did it for you. He did this for you paying the payment so that you would not have to. You reject Jesus, then you have to pay off your sin debt. What does that look like? Eternity in a place called hell forever for you. But Jesus has already done it. It's been finished for you if you will just do one simple thing. Believe upon Jesus Christ for your salvation. You do that. All of what Jesus done now becomes yours. And then you sing songs like we sing today, and you think, we sing hallelujah, you can't help it. We sing hallelujah, how can you not, after this becomes so personal, that he was on the cross suffering because of your sin. See, the chief priests, they, ones that kind of handed him over. But they're not the ones that actually drove the nails in. Who drove the nails? Roman soldiers. This was the Roman practice. But who's responsible? I mean, you could take it several different ways. Judas betraying him, chief priest, you got Satan behind the whole thing doing all this. But I also add another group in, and that's everybody in this room. You say, well, I didn't physically nail him down to that cross. You did this indirectly through your sin, and I did it through my sin because this is why he's there, not because of his own sin, but as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the entire world, your sin is up on that cross. But it's not applied to you until you believe. And that's all you would have to do today is hear God's voice speaking into your heart and respond to that and believe in Jesus Christ. And then he becomes not just a savior of the world, but your savior of the world.
it becomes very personal at this point. But don't miss that. He gave up and laid down his life. Let me give you another section here. I'm going to finish this out, and I'm going to, I'm going to hit the highlights of this. But in verse 31 through 37, let's, let's just read this. Look at this, where it says, Therefore... Because it was the preparation day. So this is the preparation day of the Passover, but it's also a preparation day of the Sabbath because they're following on this next day. This is a Friday. And so because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. That's why the Sabbath was different. You have the Passover involved in all this. And so they're trying to go on about their feast, right? This guy that's hanging up on the cross is kind of messing with all that. Let's, let's get all these people out of the way so we can go on worshiping God and celebrating God and the Passover, knowing that they're the Passover lamb at the moment they're all being killed, the Passover lambs, God's Passover lamb, and it's happening at the same time. It's incredible. God's Passover lamb has just given up his spirit, the spotless lamb of God. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So this is all the Jews are concerned about. That's great. All right, he's, they're, 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 we've gotten rid of them, they think. And so let's get them out of the way. We can carry on, on our feast and get to preparing all this stuff. So then in verse 32, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And so this shows that he's already dead. And I'll just tell you, uh, I've looked at more than I've cared to 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 want to look at on that those, that phrase right there. And so, uh, if you didn't know this, this is the, I'm I'm preaching this text in school this week. My face has been in this. I've written a whole paper on this page today, and so. Uh, I, this is why you're getting it today, and I've read over and over again all that people do all kinds of stuff with this blood and water and, and how it relates to all this other kind of stuff. Can I just make it a little bit more simple for us? Jesus died. He really, he really is dead at this point, and it's all the proof coming out. He's dead. Blood and water's coming out. I know you can look at it from a medical standpoint. You can look at it from a symbolic standpoint, a theological standpoint. You need to know this. Jesus was really dead was really dead. Now, keeping John's audience in mind, he's writing to a group of believers uh, in Ephesus 95 AD. They actually had some false teachers coming in teaching that Jesus wasn't a man. In fact, this is docetism. Let me just tell you what docetists believe. They believe that Jesus, he was just God. He wasn't really a man. He just appeared as a man. Now, that sounds crazy to us because what's the heresy that people would say today? He was just a man, not God. Right, he's not a God, that was just a man, and they got rid of him, and now you Christians made up all this stuff, and you built this tradition out of all this, and, and man, and, and you Christians just run with it. And that's kind of what people would say today, but that's not the first heresy that came in the church. The first heresy that came in the church is that he wasn't a man at all. Uh, he, was, he was just God, because uh, God would never take on material flesh, right? That material bad, spirit kind of stuff's good, and so you, kind of, you definitely see this in Gnosticism, but Docetists would believe that he just appeared as a man, he wasn't really a man. Well, if you believe that, or if you're in Ephesus in 95 AD teaching that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden this letter arrives, that blood and water comes out of his side when they pierced Jesus and stuck it into his side with a spear, Not only did he really die, he really was human. And John, throughout this whole book, would show you that he's fully human and fully God. He's absolutely both. And all that is to say, and you can critique that, you can say that's scientifically impossible, all that stuff, but John wants you to know all of that, that you might believe. He is the perfect mediator between God and man because he is both. It fulfills that cry Job had in the Psalms. Oh, that there was someone that would stand in the gap for me, uh, that I would have somebody that would mediate on my behalf. And yet Job didn't know it at the time, but here it is now being fulfilled for all mankind. You have a Savior that is all God and all man for you. And he is our high priest standing in the cap. He is the reason why our prayers can be heard. He is the reason why we can have fellowship with a holy God. It is because of Jesus. It is all because of him. He really did die. And I'd also say he really did rise again. It's great that he died. We needed that. But we also needed him to get back up. 
and the resurrection, the actual word in Greek, it, all it means is stand up. That's it. Resurrection, stand up. I'm so glad that Jesus stood up. And I'm also thankful, not only because he did it, because one day I'm going to stand up. One day, because you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you carried your own cross. Guess what? You're going to stand back up one day forever not to die again. And all those people maybe you've lost in Christ, guess what's going to happen with them? They're going to stand up. But that is not true for you if you can be confronted with a story like this and it do absolutely nothing to you. Again, this is so that you might believe. Notice how Scripture is fulfilled again in verse 35. And he who is seen has testified, his testimony is true. This was so important, John stops his story to tell you this. The crucial point, so i got to stop just to let you know this. He who has seen his testified, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. Verse 36, for these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. They think, well, he's already dead. Let's get him out of the way. And that's why his legs weren't broken. John says, no, the reason why their legs were broken is because that's how it had been written in the script already long ago. And it's played out this way because the scripture has said it was going to. I'm just telling you what God has said, it will come true. What God has said, you can base your life on it because it will happen every single detail of it. Let me just show you as we kind of close here in this last part of this text there was an influence on his cross that he had, an influence on his death that affects everybody. But there are an influence that happens on two disciples that are going to emerge up. Look at with me in verse 30, 38. After this, so again, another transition in the story. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. So who is Joseph of Arimathea? Well, you can look at all the stuff he has written about him in the other Gospels. John wants you to know he was a secret disciple. A secret disciple because of his fear of the Jews. Well, now all of a sudden that's changing. All of a sudden now Joseph of Arimathea comes out of the shadows. Joseph of Arimathea comes out, out of this being concealed in secret of following Jesus and comes up to the Roman authority that's represented there. Uh, the, uh, uh, Pontius Pilate comes up to him asking permission. Joseph of Arimathea is going public. You know what's ironic? What are, the other, what are the other disciples doing as he's going public? You know what they did? They actually trade places. It's a substitute that happens. Joseph of Arimathea comes out of the shadows. You know what the other disciples do? They go into the shadows because if you go to the next chapter, there's a door shut. And it says specifically, for fear of the Jews, they're hiding. So Jesus has to come into their midst and say, peace be to you. And so the other disciples have gone into hiding. Joseph of Arimathea, he comes out of hiding. And I'll just tell you, at some point, you've got to come out of hiding. This idea of who's your one, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to have to come out of your hiding if you're going to talk to somebody about Jesus. You're gonna have to, if you're going to carry your cross, you're just not going to be able to do that in private. You can't do that in the shadows. You can't conceal it. If you're going to carry your cross for Jesus Christ, it, Jesus himself will drag you into public. I found that out very quick. If I was going to follow Jesus, I was going to have to speak in front of people. I never in my life would have thought that would be the case. But for me to carry my cross or fulfill God's plan for me, I was going to have to go out and follow Jesus in public. Everybody's call looks different. But I'll tell you this, you got to go public. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, he will carry you out in the public because you can't carry your cross in the shadows. It will drag you out. There's another person in the text. He gets drug out of the shadows as well. Look at verse 39. And Nicodemus, well, dang, Nicodemus comes back up on the scene. Where's he been? Notice it says, who at first came to Jesus by night. Notice it goes back to John 3 when Nicodemus is questioning Jesus. He doesn't do it in the daytime. He's at night. And there's a theme of light and darkness in the, in the whole book of John, by the way. So it's, it's also showing he's still in darkness. But he comes, he's concealed. Nicodemus, though, now is coming out of the shadows. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came. Now another one's getting drug out of the shadows, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. 
Get this, by the way. Remember the, the sour wine that was just sitting there? It was just, oh, I mean, oh well, where they cru- there just happened to be a garden uh, in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, oh, by the way, j- a, a new tomb, right? All this fulfilling Isaiah that they made his burial like a, uh, uh, w- with, a, with, a, with a rich. Uh, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. But yet even in doing that, they are fulfilling Scripture. Oh, by the way, but don't miss this. Here comes Joseph Arimathea. Where has he been? Well, you didn't know he was a disciple because he's in secret. Not anymore. He comes out of the shadows in the public. Nicodemus, where has he been? Well, he been, hadn't fully emerged yet. You see some sparks coming. Uh, you, he's definitely staying in the shadows in John 3. He didn't even respond like the Samaritan woman. He doesn't even say, I want some of this water. He just doesn't even dealt with, right? Jesus goes from there and and, man, Nicodemus falls back in the shadows. But now, all of a sudden, here comes Nicodemus. And I'll just tell you, all this stuff that they're doing, all these spices and all that kind of stuff, that is characteristics of those who now are going public with Jesus Christ. I think of all those spices, and I think of Judas Iscariot. And I don't know if J- Judas would have said this, but this is the way my brain works. If Judas would have seen that, why are y'all doing this? We could have sold that and given it to the poor. <laughs> I'm just telling you, when you go all in for Jesus Christ, all your resources come with it. Everything you have, you want to give it. All this kind of, you just can't help. You, and some people, it's, you're wasting time. Some people, you're wasting money on this stuff. I'm just telling you, the best thing you could ever do is go all in on Jesus Christ. You give him everything you have, all your resources, everything is yours. And I'm telling you, if that's the road you want to take, it starts with you got to believe Number two, it start, you got to come out of the shadows. You can't follow Jesus Christ in private. Challenge for us today, carry your cross. That's the place of influence. And I'm just telling you, if we would do that, we'll have influence all over this community. We'll have influence all over this entire world. If we would just get even a few in this room to be confronted with their cross Carry your cross. And I'm telling you, if you get a whole church that'll do with that, I'm just telling you the influence would be incredible. The influence, it, it would be, we couldn't even imagine it. I will tell you this, the influence of Jesus Christ is not going away, ever. The, it will never go away, ever. However, the time we have to influence others of our lives is temporary. You've got a short amount of time to be an influence a short amount of time, and that's it. And I'll just tell you the greatest way you could ever do it is to take that cross that's got your name on it and that you would pick it up and carry it for Jesus Christ to wherever that leads. And it's probably got a place of a skull with your, where, wherever you're going. But I'm just telling you, that's the place. That's the place for the greatest influence you could ever have. I would also just tell you this. The work is done. <laughs> the work has been finished And all of this has been written to you, read to you, preached to you, for one reason, that you may believe. If that would be your decision today, we're going to have the last song here in a moment, and that would be your time to go public with Jesus Christ, to come up and let us know, I want to to follow him. And I would just tell you, if, if that's all you could say, we know what you're talking about. Today is the day of salvation. This is a wonderful text of Scripture. It's amazing. I I mean, we read it one time on Easter, and and unfortunately, we kind of maybe put it to the side. But I'm just telling you, this is something I hope we never get over. The cross of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, that it was for you. Not only did he die for your sin, but he rose again, defeating sin and death for you. And this has all been put in front of you, sir, ma'am out there, that you may believe. Maybe you say, look, I believed on Christ. All right, leave me alone. I believed. I get it. Have you picked up your cross? Sometimes we can start down that road and be like, man, it's too hard. Sometimes we can get down that road and think, no, what, this ain't worth it. But I'm glad Jesus, he took up his cross and he completed all the work. I don't know about you, but I can say this for me. I, I, I hope this is what happens. I intend for this to happen. I want to go all the way to the end. 
I'd hate for them to go, man, that boy started off pretty good. He was on fire for Jesus, and then pff, he tanked. I don't know what happened. What about you? Let's go all the way to the end, but it starts today. Would you pick up your cross today? And you're going to have to do something that's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to come out of the shadows. You can't stay there anymore. Jesus is calling you out. You can't follow me in secret. Friends need to know about Jesus Christ that you have. People all around you, some people at work, man, they don't even know that you're a Christian. You've been hanging out with people and they have no idea because it's been concealed. This whole idea of who's your one, you got to come out of the shadows. You're going to start letting people know. You have to get over that fear. You're going to have to come out. People need to know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Today is the day. Would you pick up your cross? Would you go public with Jesus? And I'm just telling you, if you would do those things, the influence you could have for Jesus Christ would be unlimited of the amount of people that you could influence. It would be unlimited, but we got to come out. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Maybe God's speaking to you a little bit right now, and maybe you've been around some people, and they, they, they just don't even know that you're a Christian. It could be you're just in secret because you're a little bit afraid. Or it could be right now, maybe you're really not. Maybe you never believed the evidence of true belief on Jesus Christ is a changed life. Maybe if God's Spirit is speaking to you, would you call out on him right now in true, authentic belief, committing everything you have to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Today, if you would do that, I'm just telling you, there would be a change that would take place that would drag you out in the public. Maybe today you just need to say, you know what, I've been, I've been in the shadows and I don't want to be there anymore. Pick up your cross. Follow Jesus. Don't conceal who you are in Christ. Let it be known. Maybe today you're just not a part of a church family. Best way to go public is if you don't have to do it by yourself, you can go public with other believers. And you could lock arms with us here at Robin Wood Baptist Church and we can go public together. And if that's a decision you want to make, this time of, of, of invitation is for you as well. Just simply come down to the front and we'll work out those details. God is calling us out of the shadows and it's time to follow him in public. Would you say yes to that today? Would you hear all of this and do one thing? Would you believe? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we give our lives to you. Lord, we acknowledge not only this is a wonderful text of Scripture, it's the good news of the gospel, but Lord, it's the truth. And God, we will be held accountable for the truth we've heard today. I pray there would be those in this room today that would believe. I pray there would be here in this room today those who would take that cross, they know it's got their name on it, they would pick it up and carry it and they would go public for you. I pray we would do all those things regardless of what we might lose, however we might get made fun of and going in public, however many friends that might not want to associate with us anymore. I pray that regardless of all the consequences, we'd pick up our cross, we would go public, we would follow you, and we would believe on Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for going public for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you go public today? Won't you believe? Won't you respond however God's moving in your heart as we sing this last song?